Hello, everyone. This is the 61st episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I am joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we welcome back Argentine journalist Mr. Nacho Di Mari as we discuss the Argentina national team matches under Cesar Luis Menotti in the year 1977. We aim to have a series of interviews with Mr. Di Mari as we examine the Cesar Luis Menotti era as Argentina national team manager. On our last two podcasts, we discussed the years 1974, 1975, and 1976 under Menotti in charge of the national team. Argentina were to host the 1978 World Cup and Menotti was tasked with building a team to win the World Cup on home soil. At this point, the World Cup was only a year away and the most serious part of the preparation would take place. And in this year, there would be many matches against strong European opposition. Let us remind ourselves where we are at the start of 1977. Argentina were under the control of a military junta led by General Videla in 1976 that we discussed in our last podcast. The country was beset by political problems as a result. And there were questions about the nation's ability to even host a World Cup. But getting back to the playing front, Menotti from the start had wanted to impose an attacking style of play for the national team and based the style of the national team like his Huracan squad of 1973 that had won the title. And at this point, his tactics consisted of zonal defense and a short passing game. However, there was a lot of clamor for the style and tactics of Boca Juniors manager Juan Carlos Lorenzo. At this point, his Boca Junior side were a successful team, but their style was the opposite of what Menotti wanted. They were mm-hmm. Boca Juniors was a physical defensive side. And mm-hmm. this opposition of styles was always in a background with the press always playing the two against one another. Mm-hmm. So we come to this year of 1977. The preparation started with a series of friendly matches against club sides. On January and February 1977 at Mar del Plata in what was called Copa de Oro. Argentina national team played matches against club sides. On end of January, they tied with Newell's old boys 2-2. On February 7th, they defeated Aldovizi 1-0. On February 9th, they tied with River Plate 2-2. On February 16th, Menotti faced off against his nemesis, Lorenzo, as Argentina defeated Boca Juniors 1-0 with a Bertoni goal. But these were all training matches against club sides. The first official friendly of this calendar year was on February 27th at uh, Buenos Aires at... uh, Boca Junior Stadium La Bombonera as Argentina faced Hungary. Also, let's remind ourselves that all the home matches that Argentina played this season were played at La Bombonera. Yes, because the River Plate Stadium was under construction for the World Cup. For this match against Hungary on February 27th, we have the following lineup. Hugo Gatti of Boca Juniors in goal. Daniel Killer of Rosario Central, Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors, captain of the side, Jorge Carascosa of Huracan, Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo, Ricardo Villa of Racing Club, he'd replaced by international debutant Jorge Benitez of Boca Juniors in the 83rd minute, Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan, Américo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys, Daniel Bertoni of Independiente, Leopoldo Luque of River Plate, and he would be replaced by 16-year-old international debutant 
Diego Armando Maradona of Argentinos Juniors in the 65th minute. Rene Hausman of Huracan, and he'd be replaced by another international debutant, Dario Fellman of Boca Juniors in the 81st minute. Quickly going through the Hungarian lineup managed by Lajos Barotti. We have Sandor Guidar of Honved, Lajlo Balint of Ferencvaros, Zoltan Kereki of Haladas, Attila Kerekes of Bekek Spaya, Joseph Toth of Uchpest, Zoltan Ebedli of Ferencvaros. He be replaced by Sandor Zombori of Vasas in the 38th minute. Janos Naji of Videoton, Sandor Pinter of Honved, Lajlo Pushtai of Ferenc Varos. He be replaced by Lajlo Fazikas of Uchpesh in the 46th minute. Andras Torochik of Uchpest. Istvan Magyar of Ferenc Varos. And he be replaced by Bela Varadi in the 46th minute. The match was an easy route for Argentina as they defeated Hungary 5-1. Bertoni scored in the 13th, 21st, and 42nd minute. Luke chipped in with two goals in the 36th and 47th minute. And Zombori pulled the goal back for Hungary in the 64th minute. Obviously, this match will be remembered for the debut of Diego Maradona. At the time, he became the second youngest player in the Argentina national team history at 16 years old and four months. Previously, Vicente Gonzalez had been selected as a 16-year-old in 1921. And also, we should mention that Ardilas also missed a penalty kick in this match. So it could have been an even higher score for Argentina. That's bizarre because he was not the, the, the designer to, to shoot the penalties, uh, Ardiles. And so there were three caps for this match. And uh, let's also discuss Dario Fellman. The, the other mm-hmm. one of the other debutants, Dario Feldman. This would be he, his one and only cap for Argentina. Mm-hmm. Years later, he would join Valencia in Spain, and mm-hmm. at the time, for anyone who might know, there would be a lot of South American players who would go to Spain, and they would take Spanish citizenship to avoid being registered as a foreign player in the league. Apparently, you couldn't do that if you had played for the national team. So when he had joined Valencia, he did not reveal that he had played for the national team so that he would be eligible as a citizen, as a naturalized Spaniard. Mm -hmm. When Valencia learned of this in 1980, they dismissed him for providing misleading information. So that's just another side story to this match. He Argentina. was, uh, I think, left winger, and he has a, a good year in, in Boca Juniors. He was uh, also, he scored a lot of goals, and that was why Menotti tried to call him to the national team. On March 2nd, Argentina plays another training match against a club, against Deportivo Roca. Of Rio Negro. Yes, and that's another win. But then the team embarks on a tour of Europe for Real Madrid's 75th year anniversary celebrations. So they're in a four-team tournament that also involves Iran and Real Madrid, obviously. So on March 22nd, at Madrid's Santiago Bernabeu, they play against Iran. For this match, we have the following lineup. Ugo Gatti, Daniel Killer, Alberto Tarantini, captain of the side Jorge Carascosa, Jorge Olguin, Ricardo Villa, he'd be replaced by Jorge Benitez in the 46th minute, Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan, Americo Gallego, Rene Hausman, and he'd be replaced by Oscar Ortiz of River Plate in the 46th minute, Daniel Bertoni, and Leopoldo Luque. This was Benitez's second and final cap. That was the end of the road for him with the national team. This match ended as a 1-1 tie. Daniel Bertoni scored off a penalty kick in the 14th minute. Mohamed Sadegui 
tied the match in the 79th minute for Iran. Argentina won the match on a penalty kick shootout, 4-1. to one. Obviously, much more was expected of Argentina. Iran played well in this match, and Ricardo Villa said that Iran were just better than us. We were too confident, and they surprised us and could have won. Argentina advanced, but clearly should have done better. Two days later, on March 24th, the face-off against Real Madrid in this uh, 75th year anniversary match, a cup match. So for this match, we have the following lineup. Hugo Gatti in goal. Daniel Killer, Alberto Tarantini, Captain of the side Jorge Carascosa, Jorge Olguin, Ricardo Villa. He replaced by Jorge Benitez in the 69th minute. We mentioned that, that the previous match was his last match, but obviously this match against Real Madrid is not an official match. Osvaldo Ardiles, Américo Gallego, Rene Hausman. He replaced by Oscar Ortiz in the 46th minute. Daniel Bertoni, Leopoldo Luque, and he'd be replaced by Umberto Bravo of Taleres de Cordoba in the 63rd minute. Quickly going through the Real Madrid lineup managed by the Yugoslav Milan Miljanic, we have Miguel Angel, Sol, Benito, Piri, Jose Antonio Camacho, the West German Paul Breitner, Manuel Velasquez, He'll be replaced by Alberto Vitoria in the 14th minute. Vicente del Bosque, Francisco Aguiar, Carlos Santiana, Jose Macanas, and he'll be replaced by Jose Luis Sanchez Barrios in the 66th minute. Real Madrid would win this match 1-0. Del Bosque scoring in the 82nd minute. Ardiles was sent off in this match in the 78th minute after a foul on Sol. So all in all, not a satisfactory tour for Argentina with a loss and a tie. I think that those matches were very experimental because he was still trying to find the players who will be a year later playing the World Cup. And even if Menotti always wanted to, to play a very good football, he will have to make some experimentations with the players to know if they were will if they were would be fit for the world cup next year now we come to the most important part of the season for this national team in the summer of 1977 argentina decided to host many european nations to test themselves for the following year's world cup and good ones. Exactly. The authorities also wanted to showcase these friendlies to show to the world that they would be able to host the main event the following year. Because as we mentioned earlier, that was also part of the talking points about whether Argentina was capable of hosting. As far as the European nations, this was an ideal opportunity to get acquainted with the climatic conditions, the venues, the atmosphere, that were they lucky to qualify, they would be facing the following year. Menotti had been very keen for these matches. He wanted the national team to play many matches in a space of a month to match the conditions that they would be facing in the World Cup in the following year. Again, the whole Menotti versus Lorenzo was still at this point part of the press chatter. And Lorenzo publicly would say that Menotti would fail in his bid to create an attractive Argentinian side. Because according to Lorenzo, the game had changed in the past decade and teams had to be more athletic to be able to win and faster. That was something typical in in Argentine football because Menotti had to face Toto Lorenzo at uh, at that time. And then it was the turn of when, when Menotti left the national team in 1982. That was Bilardo 
who was named as, as the manager, and it was the opposite of Menotti. And, and at that time was Menotti who criticized the national team when Bilardo was in charge. Yes, the whole Menotti versus Bilardo argument. Yes. Also, let's remind ourselves uh, from our previous podcast that the Argentinian Federation had passed a law forbidding national team players to transfer to European mm-hmm. sides. This law had been passed too late to stop Mario Kempes to join a European side. Menotti repeatedly would say that he would not call any European-based players for the World Cup, but did acknowledge that Campus would be the hardest player to replace. To replace. Yes. And we will get back to that, that whole Campus question. Let's get started with this series of matches against European sides. The first opponents were Poland on May 29th. And again, all these matches were at the Boca Juniors is La Bombonera Stadium. So on May 29th, Argentina hosted Poland. For this match, we have the following squad. Hugo Gatti in goal. Jorge Olguin. Captain of the side, Jorge Carascosa. Daniel Killer. Vicente Pernia of Boca Juniors. Osvaldo Ardiles. Ricardo Villa. He replaced by... Ricardo Boccini of Independiente in the 58th minute. Americo Gallego, Daniel Bertoni, Leopoldo Luque, Oscar Ortiz of River Plate. And he replaced by international debutant Omar La Roza of Independiente. Mm-hmm. We have to mention that Rene Hausman missed this match as he was suspended by his club Huracan. Going through the Polish lineup managed by Jacek Gomoc. We have Jan Tomaszewski of LKS Lodz, Marek Zuba of LKS Lodz, Vladislav Zmuda of Slask Rokla, Henry Kasperczak of Stal Mielek, Wojciech Rudy of Zaglebi Sosnowiec, Zbigniew Boniek of Vidio Lodz, he'd be replaced by Adam Nawalka of Wisla Krakow in the 44th minute. Captain of the side, Kazimierz Dana of Legia Varsa. Bogdan Majdaler of Odra Opol. Gersgors Lato of Stal Mielek. Andrzej Jarmach of Stal Mielek. Stanislav Terlecki of LKS Lodz. And he replaced by Vlodzmierz Mazur of Zaglebi Sosnowiec in the 56th minute. Very good Polish side. Yes, they were. They have finished in the third in the World Cup in, in Germany. It was basically this same team with, uh, I think, that Boniek was uh, very young uh, yes. and, and, and will became one of the most important Polish players. But uh, that team was very important. Sometimes I, I think that if uh, nowadays, perhaps all those Polish players would play in European top leagues. Oh, of course, for sure, yeah. For this match, Argentina would win 3-1. First, Poland took the lead through Lato in the 32nd minute. Argentina would be awarded a penalty kick in the 41st minute after a handball in the box, and Bertoni scored from a penalty kick. Luque scored a second goal, in the 53rd minute. And Bertoni scored his second and Argentina's third in the 72nd minute. Argentina gradually took control of the match in the second half as the pole started tiring. Good win against a good side. Next, we have a match on June 5th against defending World Cup champions West Germany, wearing green shirts for this match. Yes. This match, again, on June 5th at uh, La Bombonera, we have the following uh, squad. Hugo Gatti in goal. Vicente Pernia. Jorge Olguin. Daniel Passarella of River Plate, making his first appearance of the year. Jorge Carascosa, captain of the side from Huracan. 
He replaced by Alberto Tarantini in the 46th minute. Osvaldo Ardiles, Americo Gallego, Ricardo Villa. He replaced by Ricardo Buccini of Independiente in the 44th minute. Daniel Bertoni, Leopoldo Luque, Omar La Rosa, and he replaced by Oscar Ortiz in the 76th minute. Going through the West German lineup managed by Helmut Schoen, we have the following squad. Bernd Frank of Eintracht Braunschweig, captain of the side Bertie Vox of Borussia Mönchengladbach, Bernard Dietz of Duisburg, Rolf Rusman of Schalke, Manfred Kaltz of Hamburg, Reiner Bonhoff of Borussia Mönchengladbach, Rudiger Abramchik of Schalke, Bernd Holzenbein of Eintracht Frankfurt, Klaus Fischer of Schalke, Erich Beer of Hertha Berlin. He'd be replaced by Karlheinz Rummenigge of Bayern Munich in the 70th minute and Jörg Volkert of Hamburg. This match, the Argentines would struggle as the Germans would just control from the start. Klaus Fischer gave West Germany the lead as early as the eighth minute. The West Germans would score their second goal through Fischer in the 61st minute, and Holzenbein would add a third goal in the 70th minute. In the 73rd minute, Daniel Passarella would pull a goal back for Argentina, but the Germans were fully in control. The local press would describe this match as a lesson in football for the national team. The Argentinian fans even applauded the West Germans for their performance. And what is something to notice is that all the goals were scored by headers, all the four goals of the match. Oh, yes, yes. And something I think we may have mentioned before in our previous uh, podcast, Vicente Pernia's son actually would play, his son Mariano would actually play for the Spanish national team around 2006 right. and 2007. Yes. Also, this was Ugo Gatti's 18th and final cap. Just bearing in mind, he gained 18 caps from 1967 to 1977. He was a legendary figure of Argentine football who perhaps with the national team never really played as much as he should have, but he's always well known for his distinctive headband and his longevity in the game. It, and, he, and he was his kind of play. It was beyond those days because he uses his feet. He used to play like a libero, like the last man. And at that time, the defenses didn't work like that. And he was a very good goalkeeper, one of the best, without doubt. Yes. Do you think his performance in this match made Menotti decide that he was not going to be the goalkeeper for the national team? Or uh, I don't know if, if it was something related to those matches, to those, those series, series of matches. I think that it had more to do with the style of play because uh, Filiol, who then became the goalkeeper for the team in the World Cup and, of course, was one of the best goalkeepers of, of, of that uh, World Cup in Argentina, his style was very different, was the opposite of the style of uh, Gatti. And I think that Menotti thought that Filiol his style of play would fit better in uh, in the team and in the way he want to play. In any case, yeah, that was the end of the road for Gatti with the national team. And I guess for the rest of the year, Hector Ballet would take over. Mm -hmm. He was surnamed Chocolate. Yes. Chocolate Ballet. For the next match of this friendlies, on June 12th, Argentina faced off against England at La Bombonera. For this match, we have the following lineup. Hector Ballet of Huracan in goal. Daniel Killer. Daniel Passarella. Vicente Pernia. 
Alberto Tarantini, Osvaldo Ardiles, Ricardo Boccini. He'd replaced by Omar La Rosa in the 54th minute. With Carascosa not playing, Americo Gallego was captain of the side. Daniel Bertoni, Leopoldo Luque, Oscar Ortiz, and he replaced by Juan Ramon Roca of Newell's Old Boys in the 54th minute. Going through the England lineup, managed by Don Reeby, we have Ray Clements of Liverpool in goal, Phil Neal of Liverpool, Trevor Cherry of Leeds, Brian Greenhoff of Manchester United, he replaced by Ray Kennedy of Liverpool in the 46th minute. Dave Watson of Manchester City. Emlyn Hughes of Liverpool. Captain of the side, Kevin Keegan of Hamburg. Mike Shannon of Southampton. Stuart Pearson of Manchester United. Ray Wilkins of Chelsea. And Brian Talbot of Ipswich. Going through the match, there would be a double sending off in this match. The Argentinian fans booed the English national anthem and they chanted animals in reference to Alf Ramsey's insult from 1966 World Cup. Again, we have to mention that Argentina were still missing the suspended Hausman. England would actually take the lead just within two minutes when Stuart Pearson scored from Shannon's near post cross. In the 15th minute, Brian Greenhoff fouled Daniel Bertoni at the edge of the box, and Bertoni scored from a free kick. Otherwise, the match was a defensive, cautious match from both sides. There was more drama towards the end when Trevor Cherry fouled Bertoni and Bertoni got off and punched Cherry and knocked some teeth out. Both players were sent off. Both players had been booked before the match as well. We should mention that ultimately the Argentine Federation suspended Bertoni for four matches and also exonerated Cherry. Paul, do you remember any anything? I mean, obviously you were too young to remember anything from this match, but in the subsequent years, has there been some discussion and, about this match and the violence? I, I, <laughs> yeah, I think it was just a, a continuation of, of the previous history and uh, specifically 1966, as you mentioned, there was obviously, you know, that, that was still relatively recent and an issue at the time. Um, it was still very rare for England players to be sent off. I think this was only the third Trevor Cherry was only the third English player to be sent off. So that was obviously quite an event at the time. And maybe not England's greatest era either towards the end of um, Don Revy's time in charge. So I think it was certainly regarded as a good result for England, e- even in a friendly, to, to draw in Argentina. Obviously, we have to mention that England would not qualify for the World Cup at this point, even their qualification seemed in doubt with Italy ahead in the group. They had a, a very strong team because at that time, I thought Liverpool was the top team in Europe, without doubt. Yeah, they won the Champions Cup just a few weeks mm-hmm. before this match. Yeah, Three days later, on June 18th, again at La Bombonera, Argentina faced another British opponent as they faced Scotland in another ill-tempered match. Incidentally, it was pointed out that the Argentinian fans did not boo the Scottish national anthem as they had the English one. For this match, we have the following Argentine lineup. Hector Ballet in goal. Pedro Gonzalez of River Plate. He replaced by Alberto Tarantini in the 59th minute. Daniel Killer, Daniel Passarella, captain of the side Jorge Carascosa, Vicente Pernia, Americo Gallego, Osvaldo Ardiles, Omar La Rosa. He replaced by international debutant Victor Trocero of Union Santa Fe in the 70th minute. Leopoldo Luque and Rene Hausman of Huracan. 
making his debut in this series of friendly matches. Let me go through the Scotland lineup managed by Alistair McLeod. You have Alan Ruff of Patrick Thistle and Goal, Danny McGrain of Celtic Glasgow, Willie Donachy of Manchester City, Archie Gemmel of Derby County, Thomas Forsyth of Rangers Glasgow, captain of the side Martin Buchan of Manchester United, Don Masson of Queen's Park Rangers. Kenny Dalglish of Celtic Glasgow, Lou Macari of Manchester United, Asa Hartford of Manchester City, and Willie Johnson of West Bromwich Albion. So again, just like the previous match against England, it was a very tight match, riddled with fouls. The match. Because, uh, I, let, let, let me let me tell you something. That it's something historically that the. Um, Uh, British football, it's very difficult to the South American football to confront. And that was why those matches were very rough for both teams, especially for, for Argentina, those kind of matches. But I, I was seeing the, 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 the lineup of Argentina and uh, nine players of, uh, of those that you mentioned did it to the World Cup, finally. Yes. So This match ended as a 1-1 tie. Both goals were scored off penalty kicks. Don Masson scored for Scotland in a penalty kick in the 77th minute after Douglas was fouled by Killer in the box. Passarella, a few minutes later in the 80th minute, also scored from a penalty kick after Trocero was fouled in the box. We should mention that this was Vicente Pernia's 10th and final cap. His first cap had been in 1973. Also, just like the match in England, there will be a double sending off in the 56th minute. Uh, Vicente Pernia punched Willie Johnson in retaliation after a foul. And again, both players were sent off. Instead, after the match, Menotti defended the violent tactic of his players, which was which seems a bit strange, but I guess he felt that they needed to, they had to toughen up against strong opposition, perhaps. That was uncharacteristic given his tactics and his, his way of, of, of good seeing football. For, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Again, Paul. In British circles, is this match also referenced because of the, the violence and all that, or Yeah, I think mean, there's, there's certainly less history between Argentina and Scotland than there was for the England game. But Scotland qualified for the, for the World Cup and were, you know, they, they qualified in 74 and 78. So they were, on those results, they were the, the strongest British team of the of the day. Obviously, some, some great players in that team as well. So I think like... Um, Nacho said, especially then, there was probably quite a, a difference of styles and, and, and football cultures. So it seems that, you know, when, when those um, nations were meeting more often than not, there, there was um, a little bit of conflict and confrontation in the games. Well, let me, let me ask you, was Willis Johnson the one who was suspended uh, yes. during the World Cup in 1978? That's the one, That's yes. right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, same one, yeah. He was, he was known as a little bit of a character. So. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I remember. That's it, yeah. He used to love drinks, I thought. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> a little. <laughs> yeah. Only a little. There was a break of about a week, uh, and on June 26th, Argentina hosted the French. So for this match, again, at La Bombonera. I was there, Sahan. Eh? I was oh, at that match. At the stadium. Very good. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> we have the following squad. Hector Ballet in goal. And I should mention, no sending offs in this match. So that... <laughs> <laughs> So, Hector Ballet, Alberto Tarantini, Daniel Killer, he'd be replaced by Jorge Olguin in the 69th minute, Daniel Passarella, 
Captain of Zar Jorge Carascosa, Omar La Rosa, Américo Gallego, Ricardo Villa, Pedro Gonzalez. He'd be replaced by Osvaldo Ardiles in the 46th minute. Leopoldo Luque. He'd be replaced by Oscar Victor Trocero in the 60th mm -hmm. minute. Rene Hausman. And going to the French lineup managed by Michel Hidalgo, you have the following lineup. Dominique Baratelli of Nice in goal. Patrick Batiston of Metz. Patrice Rio of Nantes. Marius Trezor of Olympic Marseille. Maxime Bossis of Nantes. Captain of the side, Henri Michel of Nantes. He'd be replaced by Alain Giras of Bordeaux in the 80th minute. Omar Sahnoun of Nantes. Michel Platini of Nancy. Bruno Baronkelli of Nantes. He'd be replaced by Jacques Zimaco of Saint-Étienne in the 64th he, minute. And he Zimaco... Died, he, yeah, just days ago. Like yeah. Last week, yes. Yeah, yeah. Olivier Rouillet of Nancy. Loïc Amis of Nantes. And he'd be replaced by Didier Six of Lens in the 76th minute. This match ended as a scoreless tie. The French appeared to be in better shape, especially in the first half. I guess in the second half, Villa and Hausman pressed harder, but the French held on. The French players had expected sterner match. Platini described the Argentina squad as too static and lacking the quality of surprise to worry most European teams. After the match, the Argentinian press tried to get Michel Hidalgo to say why Argentinians had played poorly, but uh, Hidalgo didn't fall into the trap and he just limited his responses to his own team diplomatically. Also mentioned they would face France for the World Cup too the following year. Yes. So. It, it, it also France and Hungary for 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 the first match, they both were in in the same group a year yes. later. Yes. The next match against European opposition was on July third, again at La Bombonera against Yugoslavia. For this match, we have the following squad: Hector Ballet, Jorge Olguin. Captain of the side, Jorge Carascosa, Alberto Tarantini, Ruben Galvan of Independiente, Daniel Passarella, Rene Hausman, Osvaldo Ardiles, Leopoldo Luque, he replaced by Victor Trocero in the 67th minute, Ricardo Villa of Racing Club, he replaced by Ricardo Boccini in the 67th minute, and Oscar Ortiz of River Plate. And this was Trocero's third and final cap. All his caps were in this year of 1977. Going through the Yugoslavia lineup, managed by the trio of Marko Valok, Stevan Vilotic, and Goko Zec, we have the following lineup. Ivan Katalinic of Hajduk Split, George Vujkov of Vojvodina Novi Sad, Nenad Stojkovic, of Partizan Belgrade, Vladimir Zayec of Dinamo Zagreb, Ante Rajkovic of Sarajevo, Sreko Bogdan of Dinamo Zagreb, Ilya Zavisic of Partizan Belgrade, he'd be replaced by Dusan Savic of Red Star Belgrade in the 62nd minute, Drazen Muzinic of Hajduk Split, Slaviza Zungul of Hajduk Split, Mustafa Hukic of Sloboda Tuzla. He'd be replaced by future gunner Vladimir Petrovic of Red Star Belgrade in the 62nd minute. Captain of the side, Ivika Suryak of Hajduk Split. And he'd be replaced by Borislav Georgievich of Hajduk Split in the 72nd minute. Argentina would win this match 1-0 with a penalty kick uh, by Passarella in the 33rd minute and move on. Yeah, not much can be said about this match. Yugoslavia, I, I'm not sure. This may have been their only match in the tour and maybe they just arrived, not ready to play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. But again, it, it was one of the more, most important teams in, in, in Europe. They played in the World Cup in Germany too. So it was uh, good to measure more or less with the most important European teams at the moment. Finally, we come to the final match against European oppositions. On July 12th, again at La Bombonera, Argentina faced off against East Germany. So we have the following squad. Hector Bale, Daniel Passarella, Alberto Tarantini, Jorge Olguin, Captain of the Jorge Carascosa, Osvaldo Ardiles. He'll be replaced by Juan Ramon Roca in the 83rd minute. This would be Roca's third and final cap for Argentina. His first cap had been in the previous year. Ruben Galvan, Ricardo Villa, Rene Hausman, Leopoldo Luque, and Oscar Ortiz. Going through the East German lineup managed by Jörg Buschner, we have Jürgen Kroy of Sachsen Rings Vikau, captain of the side Hans Jürgen Dorner of Dynamo Dresden, Konrad Weiss of Karl Zeiss Vienna, Lothar Kurbjuweit of Karl Zeiss Vienna, Joachim Fritsch of Lokomotiv Leipzig, Reinhard Hafner of Dynamo Dresden, Hartmut Schad of Dynamo Dresden, Joachim Müller of Karl Marx Stadt of Chemnitz. He replaced by Reinhard Lauk of Dynamo Berlin in the 61st minute. Reiner Sachse of Dynamo Dresden. He replaced by Hans Jürgen Riediger of Dynamo Berlin in the 70th minute. Jürgen Sparwasser of Magdeburg, Peter Cote of Dynamo Dresden, and he be replaced by Martin Hoffman of Magdeburg in the 58th minute. Argentina won this match 2-0 with goals by Hausman in the 30th minute and Carascosa in the 72nd minute. So at least they ended on a high note with two wins against Yugoslavia and East Germany. Now, before we discuss the lessons learned from these uh, matches in the summer of 77, let's discuss the last two friendlies of the year and then go back and discuss the lessons. Because Argentina played two more matches in August as part of the Bogado Cup against Paraguay. The names of the Cups. Oh, oh my yeah. God. <laughs> Bogado Cup, so we have Argentina facing off against Paraguay on August 24th. You have the following squad. Hector Ballet, Jorge Olguin, Captain of the Jorge Carascosa, Daniel Killer, Daniel Passarella, Rene Hausman, Ruben Galvan, Ricardo Villa. He's replaced by Diego Maradona of Argentina's juniors in the 60th minute. Osvaldo Ardiles. He'd be replaced by Americo Gallego in the 46th minute. Daniel Bertoni, Leopoldo Luque. This match, Argentina would win 2-1. Luque would score in the 10th and the 78th minute. And Fermin Escobar would pull a goal back for Paraguay in the 28th minute. A week later, on August 31st, again as part of his Bogado Cup, Argentina traveled to Asuncion to face off against Paraguay. So we have the following lineup. Hector Ballet, Jorge Olguin, Alberto Tarantini, Captain of the Sai, Jorge Carascosa, Daniel Killer, Américo Gallego, Diego Maradona of Argentinos Juniors, Osvaldo Ardiles, Daniel Bertoni, Rene Hausman. He be replaced by Oscar Ortiz in the 67th minute. International debutant, Omar Roldan of Vélez Sarsfield. This would be his one and only match for Argentina. And he'd be replaced by Leopoldo Luque in the 67th minute. For this match, Paraguay would win 2-0. Alberto Tarantini would score an own goal in the 48th minute. And to compound his misery, he'd be sent off in the 60th minute. Carlos Espinola would score a second goal in the 71st minute. The match went to a penalty kick shootout 
Paraguay 1-3-1. Actually, Maradona missed one of the Argentina's penalty kicks. This was Jorge Carascosa's 30th and final cap for Argentina. So Argentinian captain of that at, up to that point. This was his final match for the national team. His first cap had been in 1970. We've discussed in a previous podcast the reasons why, but we'll discuss more, of course, because it's significant for the national team that the captain quit the team. Let's discuss the lessons learned from the very important matches against European sides in the summer of 77. The public and the press were disappointed with the performances, especially Menotti's tactics. And also the fouls the, and the punches in the matches against England and Scotland. During the matches, which all we mentioned were played at La Bombonera, the public would routinely chant for the name of Juan Carlos Lorenzo. But I guess that's to be expected because they were playing at Boca Stadium. Yes, the, for sure. We mentioned that Menotti had said that he would not select foreign-based players. After these matches, he was forced to make a concession to that principle. He would be forced to recall Mario Kempes because his absence was sorely felt. Sure. Also, his image as a preacher of a beautiful game was somewhat tarnished with some of the foul play. At this point, it was still hard to see that this team would be World Cup champions in a year's time. I think that the team was in formation. And as I, I, I talked before, there was some kind of experimentation with the players, with the position of them. But from all those matches, more or less 10, perhaps 11 players make it to the final team. Even thought if uh, they lose, for example, as you say, Carrascosa, who was the, the captain of the team, and he was a value player, not only in, in the pitch, but also outside the pitch. So Menotti had to deal with that, and he later made the decision to give the captain of the team to Daniel Alberto Passarella, who became one of the perhaps the most important defender in the history of Argentine football. Paul, what do you think about this season and some of the matches? Yeah, it's an an interesting approach to to have so many European teams and, as we said, top teams visiting over the course of the year for Argentina to test themselves. And there's a lot of the familiar names there. And I think as we've just come to that, you know, maybe they just needed an extra element to that team and Mario Kempes was was that player. Um, I just wanted to ask Nacho, he's obviously only just featured a little bit this season, but when did you first become aware of, of Maradona and what was his reputation at this early stage of his career? Was he already uh, being regarded as a, a great player? That was... The press was uh, pushing, I think, perhaps too hard to name uh, Maradona as a uh, player of the, national, of the national team. Of course, it was a very a fantastic player and, and very young. He was 16 years old, more or less, at that time. And he was playing Argentino, in Argentino Juniors and he was remarkably but I think that Menotti wanted to be very patient with him. That's the final reason why he didn't call him to the World Cup. He made it into the last weeks when Menotti had to decide which players he would left and, and not take to the, to the World Cup. And Maradona, some part of the journalists would be disappointed, disappointed and other part will be satisfied because they thought that the, it was be very important to have players with a background history in the national team. But once you realize it was Maradona, you will say, why didn't they call him? But, well, it's, it's 
more or less uh, what happens with Messi in the World Cup in Germany in 2006. Uh, six. Yeah. He was, uh, even if it was Peckerman, one of one of the managers that used to play Messi in, in the national team, in, in the lower division of the, of the national team, he didn't use it a lot in that World Cup. And nowadays you say, why not? But well, at that time, it was not something so weird. Just too young at the time, maybe, Maradona. I think so. Yes, yes. Perhaps he, he will be in the, in the World Cup. He will have 17 years old. So he was a very, very young player. How strong was the clamor for Juan Carlos Lorenzo to be the national team manager? Were there, was the press openly asking for uh, Menotti to be sacked in his place? Or was this just something that was always in the background, but not really? No, I think that the, 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 your last appreciation, it was something in the background. Menotti took charge of the national team in, in a time that there was really nothing as an organization. So he had to deal with, started with zero things and start the construction, not only of the team, but of the, uh, the people who would work with him. So I think that Menotti did a very good job because he gave some identity to the, to the football in Argentina. And the press, there was a lot of journalists that they didn't want Menotti because how he used to speak, he's a very clever man. He doesn't speak all the time about football. And perhaps these things would not be good to some kind of journalists. And they push with uh, El Toto Lorenzo. First, because he was making a very good job in Boca even thought the way of playing, as you told before, was very, very, very different. It was the opposite. One, one in, in, in one hand, we have uh, the, the football of Menotti, and in the other one, the football of Lorenzo. One prefers to be defensive, first of all, and the other one wants to be offensive, first of all. The attack was in the in the hand of Menotti and the defense was in the hand of, in the hand of Lorenzo. The other thing to notice is that there were not too many new caps. Menotti seemed to more or less be settling on a side. I think that he he was with for for example Ardiles, Gallego, Pasarela, Luque, there were key players that were founding their space in, in, in the, the national team. Bertoni also, Ortiz. There, there were some players that I think that he was sure that they were going to be in the World Cup. Tarantini, even if he was a young player, or a young defender, used to play very well in the national team. Olguin, who was very criticized because he used to play like a defender, in the side and in uh, San Lorenzo, he used to play sometimes at, as first defender, central defender. And everybody would complain him, but Menotti was very sure which team he was going to, to manage. And I think that in these games, he finally found those uh, players. For example, Pasarela became to take uh, the penalties. That was one of the most important penalty shooters that we, we have. And also, he sometimes tried to put some players that were in a good shape at that time. For example, Pedro Gonzalez, who was uh, playing for River Play, he has two or three appearances. But I think that he was, in his head, uh, Hoseman, for example, was a player that he used to manage in Huracan. He knew him very well. And I think that he was a very fantastic player. And I think that he was shaping the team that would uh, finally be selected for the World Cup. The missing pieces in a puzzle were Philol and Kempes, basically, at this point. That's right. 
That's right. Because F Filiol was also in River from 1975, and he was uh, one of the best goalkeepers in Argentina, without doubt. And also because the, the press here in Argentina, I, I think that in, in England too, Paul, they, they want to have two different kind of. Uh, so they have Gatti and Filiol, and they have a very different kind of or style of playing. And Gatti was the one who want to play with the, the foot. He was uh, like a libero playing outside the box. And Filiol was the opposite. He, he was playing in the box. He usually tried not to get out of there, but he was physically incredible. He, he jumped from one to from one place to another. And the press would also speak about Gatti and Filiol, Menotti and Toto Lorenzo. Years later, Menotti and Bilardo, Kempes y Maradona. Uh, always Argentine journalism seems to have the, the way of, of finding the opposite of what they got. So they have to find another one to face it and create something for the press. As far as this year, as the year ended, what was the Argentine public and press's uh, hopes and optimisms for the World Cup? I think that there were a lot of doubts from the press, as I repeat. I think that Menotti was shaping the team, but the press was a little bit disappointed with the results and the kind of playing in these matches against the most strong European teams at the time. But I think that if I remember years later, in uh, 1985, the national team also was perhaps more poor than what Menotti did in, in, in this year. Uh, yeah, they barely qualified. And, yeah, well, they're difficult. Yes. They qualified in difficulty, I should say. In yeah. difficult, and, and, and they yeah. played really bad. So I think that perhaps that has to do with the players, the head in the players, about thinking of... Because here they, they knew that the team was already qualified for, for the, the World Cup, so this is something different. But I think that they have to be reassured that they were going to be in the national team for the World Cup. And perhaps it's not the same playing as you know that you are going to be part of the, of the team than playing, trying to find a place in that team. And uh, I think that this year was good for Menotti to do that, to, to find the players that were going to be in the World Cup. And the press always, as I told before, they always find players that, why don't you use this one instead of that one? Um, but this is part of the journalists here in Argentina. There's also probably a bit more pressure and expectation with playing a World Cup at home as well. That, that, that adds to it. And playing all these friendlies at home as well the year mm -hmm. before. There's just a little bit more pressure maybe on the players in that, in that situation. Yeah, sure, sure. Because uh, it was the first time that in one month, more or less, a month and a half, all the most important teams and players in the world or in Europe came to, to Argentina to face the national team. Because you have, uh, as we, we talk, Poland with uh, Lato, Dana, Rumeni in Germany, Klaus Fischer, the English players, Kevin Keegan. So there were Platini in France. The most important players at the time were visiting and playing in Argentina. And that was very, very good, I think. It was a little World Cup, can we say. On our next podcast, we will pick up with this year of 1978 and the World Cup and discuss the World Cup triumph of Argentina. Once again, we would like to thank Mr. Di Mari for his participation in this series. 
As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. You may contact me on my blog and on Facebook under Soccer Nostalgia. On Twitter, I'm at SP1873. Mr. Paul Whittle can be contacted on his blog, The 1888 Letter, and on Twitter, he's at 1888 Letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify under Soccer Nostalgia Talk Podcast. And now the podcast will also be uploaded on YouTube. Very good news. Mr. Dimari's contact info on Twitter he is at L Oleg. And all this information is always listed on the blog and Spotify listings. Nacho, thank you once again. And it's a pleasure. And we'll continue with 1978 next time. Okay. That's a good year. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) We look forward to next time. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you once again. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Shahan. Bye, Paul. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.